What I want to talk about today is start bringing you guys along my street photography journey. Because as you may have noticed, I've been kind of leaking that in here in the past here on the channel. So if you are new here and you're into both cinematography from a working cinematography in LA, or you're into photography, specifically maybe portraits or street photography, then maybe check out uh, thinking about hitting the subscribe button. I'm just an amateur in the world of photography. Uh, however, uh, my day job is cinematography. And the funny thing is I kind of went backwards and I was having a conversation with a buddy of mine about this, most guys start out doing photos and then they enter into the video world. I'm the complete opposite. And an added bonus to that is not only did I start doing video first, but I was an actor for like 20 years in the film community, like specifically a member of the Screen Actors Guild since 2011. So my whole kind of background is very, very different from I can guarantee anyone else in the camera YouTube community. So just another reason to hit the subscribe button if you are new here, because I'm bringing a whole different perspective to this camera world, specifically here on the YouTube. What I tell you all of that is to tell you because around April of this year, why I even bought the Sigma FP to begin with. So chances are, if you're one of my newer subscribers, it's because you saw my massive review of this FP. And that video has been my number one video since the day it came out on April 5th of this year. It now has like 263,000 views of it. I did get a lot of new subscribers. So thanks for that if you're a Sigma FP uh, owner or something like that. But to be honest with you guys, the whole reason I bought the FP is to take advantage of some full frame photography with specifically a lot of my vintage lenses like the Minolta Rocours. I have an entire playlist of those guys down below. And I started adapting Leica M lenses to this. So that's what brings us to what we're gonna be talking about in today's video, which is this little bad boy right here. This is a Canon LTM native Leica thread mount lens. But before we get into that, because I do want to kind of talk about this idea of cinematographers practicing photography. And I saw another like street photographer video recently where they were talking about, it's not a good idea to cross pollinate your feeds. And this was talking about a street photographer making a separate Instagram for his fashion photography. This is nonsense to me. I don't believe in any of that, okay? And I'll tell you my prime reason why. The ASC, AKA the American Society of Cinematographers, okay, you're talking about the elitist, some of Hollywood's finest DPs in the world, okay, but certainly in the United States because other countries have their own society of cinematographers, okay? But certainly here in America, it's the American Society of Cinematographers. They do constant segments on photography in their monthly publications. So I highly encourage you to check out M. David Mullen's Instagram feed, who he's most recently known for being the DP of the Amazon show, uh, Marvelous Miss Maisel, or Sir Roger Deakins' book, Byways, which is chilling out back there right now. But thanks to my wife, I do have a signed copy of that. <laughs> That's pretty rad. Anyways, I tell you all that because I, I don't believe that you should separate your work. Cinematography and photography may be two slightly different beasts, but at the end of the day, they're both still sucking off of that same fat, juicy teat of capturing both light and shadow, okay? You have to think of it the same way how athletes do cross training, right? So they're synonymous, in my opinion, photography and cinematography. If you don't know how to take one photograph, what makes you think you can take 24 in a second? Now that is a very hardcore slow burn, okay? But it is something to think about. Why I got so obsessed with street photography back in April and the obsession and the passion of street photography has only grown larger and larger throughout this year is because it's really not only teaching me how to capture better images and most certainly on the fly, but it's also training me in how to view the world. And I love what one, I don't know who said this, but someone said, you know, the key to separating your own photography and cinematography for that matter from all everyone else's, right? Because right now we have a crazy cell phone camera craze going on. Because of this cell phone photography craze, how do you separate your work from everyone else? Well, the key to this is learning how to put your eye into the audience's eye, bringing your audience, making you part of the photo, putting you in the photo without physically putting yourself in the photo or your cinematography work. That's the trick. That's what separates the amateurs from the elitists, right? For instance, when I first went to the private screening of Amsterdam here in LA, and I had no clue going into that other than David O. Russell was a director and Christian Bale was in it because they were the two guest speakers there. I did not know who shot Amsterdam until the movie started playing and I go, oh, this looks like a Chivo film. Lo and behold, much to my ignorance, yes, it was in fact shot by Emmanuel Lebeski. So this is what I'm talking about. The greatest of the greats have found a way 
to make their work immediately look like their work. Bradford Young is another great example of this. Anything I ever watch, I can always tell instantly that Bradford Young was the DP. Adam Newport Barra, right? Him too, he does all the Kendrick Lamar videos. Uh, he did Last Black Man in San Francisco, one of my favorite films of all time. Anything that that man shoots, I know instantly it was him. It's the style of these cinematographers, right? And that's what they've done. They have learned how to tap into this secret ingredient that separates them from the masses. They have learned how to put themselves into the images they're capturing. I think in practicing street photography, I'm learning, I'm learning how to figure this out. It's a very slow process. Again, I'm brand new to the world of street photos. Okay? I've only been doing it since April of this year. Not a lot of time. And like our legend, uh, the godfather of street photography, Henri Cartier-Bresson, he even said that it takes any photographer 10,000 negatives before they take their first good photograph. And this goes back to the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours theory, right? Okay, so I just wanted to say all that to get that out of the way because I think I think people, some diehard cinematographers on my channel might be like, why is he doing these street photo videos? And, uh, but you know, it's fun, it's different. But at the end of the day, cinematography has always been my main passion and quite honestly, my main source of income and it will probably continue to be because that's just where I excel at, especially me being such a longtime member of the filmmaking community. But I just don't want people to think like I'm switching gears here, I'm just not. Just think of these photography videos as the B-sides. So with that being said, let's flip the tape to the B-side and let's listen to the track. Now let's try something a little different. So today we are looking at this vintage Canon lens from 1956. Now this was back before Canon were the insanely camera titans that they are today. Now all the photos I'm showing in today's video throughout, these are all taken with this Canon lens on the Sigma FP, unless of course stated otherwise. Now there are two main reasons why I was first attracted to this little lens. One is its tiny size. It's really perfect for street photography and travel. But secondly, this lens was famously rumored, but yet sometimes even seen in some old photos to be used by street photography legend, Gary Winogrand. Now me personally, I absolutely love Gary Winogrand's images. He took some of the most iconic black and white street photos ever until his passing in 1984, but his work is still revered today and rightfully so. I also just love the way Gary worked on the streets. Now I've watched a lot of docs and interviews with him and well, one, I absolutely love his philosophies, but I also really like watching him operate on the street, mainly because it's really hard to tell when he's actually taking a picture or not. However, uh, with that being said, he was widely known for taking mass amounts of photos. And let me remind you, this is way before the world of digital. So this man spent a lot of money on film. In fact, after he died, they discovered thousands of undeveloped rolls of film in his home. And me, myself, I've been gravitating more and more towards black and white photography these past few months because as you know, if you subscribe to this channel, you already know that I do suffer from a red-green colorblind. So monochrome kind of makes more sense for me. And because of that, I have been trying to train my eyes to see the world in tones rather than color. So now we're getting back into those Ansel Adams, you know, days because the color I view is so skewed anyways. It's kind of one of the another reasons I'm such a big fan of Nicholas Reffin films. So if I'm messing with color, it's, it's either insanely highly saturated or it's just monochrome. So I don't have to deal with it at all. So with photography, especially with street photography, it just made more sense. Hey man, let's just take color out of the equation altogether. And you know, and Gary's photos have have been a great source of inspiration for that, as well as, you know, the legend Henri Cartier-Bresson. Now, a quick note for all of my Sigma FP users out there that want to play around with monochrome on this particular camera. So the FP has a universal tone control curve, which I most definitely use all the time. And normally I have it set it to like negative five in the highlights and about plus two, maybe sometimes plus three in the shadows. And that's mainly because the FP is notoriously bad for clipping the highlights. That clipping the highlights issue is honestly one of the most biggest things that chapped my ass about this camera since literally day one. But as I showed in my review video of that latitude test, you know, thankfully the FP is, is one of the most insanely recoverable cameras when underexposing. So a lot of times you can work around that if you just gotta get used to underexposing your image by like at least one stop, at least. However, what's really cool is when you are in the monochrome picture profile on the FP, you can change the toning effect, which is exclusive to the monochrome mode only. 
which is really nice for experimenting with different tones under various lighting conditions. Anyways, enough about FP, let's get back to this crazy Canon lens. This is actually one of the few Canon lenses that were born out of the 1950s, known as the S series or Cyranar, to help battle some of the drawbacks of the original Gauss designs of that era. So these were literally intended to be better performers, specifically when it comes to flare and coma. Now this one is the 28 millimeter f2.8. It's a very tiny lens weighing in at only 142 grams. Now just to give you a reference on its size here, I put it between a vintage Minolta Rocor 28 millimeter f2 and an old Canon FD 28 millimeter f2.8. Now this little Canon is originally a Leica thread mount or LTM, but I have converted it to Leica M mount. And as you can see, it did not change the size whatsoever. In fact, you probably can't even tell that I have an adapter on there at all. Now, for those of you unaware, it is very easy to convert Leica M to Leica L. And as you'll see, that adapter is also fairly small and it makes a nice compact setup when the Serenar is attached to the Sigma FP. And despite stacking adapters, achieving infinity focus is no problem. I think that's mainly due to how perfect the Kuypen LTM to M mount adapter is. You know, it's pretty much a native M mount lens now. In fact, something that makes the Kuypen adapter even more advanced is that it has the six bit encoding. So all of my Leica M users out there will know what that is and appreciate that. Now, if you are more of a portrait shooter, then you will need a different kind of L to M mount adapter, specifically, which will allow you to achieve a little bit better of a close focusing distance. So this little guy has only six aperture blades. However, you're not gonna get much bokeh out of a 28 mil F 2.8 lens anyways, but the sun stars are kind of cool when they are stopped down. It has a nice typical M mount focusing lever on the focus ring, which actually has a locking mechanism at infinity. However, the lens is very, very tiny, making it kind of awkward to focus because it sits so close to the camera body. One of the main reasons why M mount lenses were never really thought of to be used for cinematography use. They're just way too small. However, the L mount adapter helps with getting the lens a little bit further away from the camera body. Now, as far as build quality goes, this little guy is very sturdy. It does not feel like a toy because it is all metal and brass. The optical design consists of six elements in four groups. And I really like that the front element is so far recessed. So you don't really need a lens hood with this little guy. And that design is actually pretty unique for a 28 millimeter. This lens has always been a favorite amongst photographers. In fact, Canon produced it for nearly two decades because it was so popular of a lens. So there are over 10,000 of these little guys floating around out there. And the price is generally average around 500 US dollars. I picked mine up for 465 bucks total. I've left an eBay link down below to fast track your search just in case any of you are interested. But what I like most about this lens is its versatility when out on the street when range focusing. And I've made this mistake in the past and, and I've been corrected by photographers much more wiser than me. It is not actually called zone focusing. The correct terminology is range focusing. So let's talk about that. So on the street, I don't really have much time to focus. Um, it's one of the reasons why lately I've been using this 18 mil Leica TL lens because of the autofocus, even though the autofocus on the FP is not so hot. However, this lens is way, way snappier autofocus compared to the actual Sigma native L mount lenses. However, if you're using really cool vintage M mount lenses, there's a really simple thing to achieve great focus. And it's as simple as setting the lens to something like an F8 or an F5.6. But for this example, let's stick to F8. That usually tends to be my go-to when I'm out on the street. And here's the thing too, if you're someone that loves to shoot wide open, something you have to consider with street photography, a lot of the magic of street photography is including the background in your scene, right? This isn't, you're not out there shooting portraits, right? You, you are capturing the moment as you see it, right? Like, and this goes back to what I was talking about in the intro of this video. How do you make the audience feel what you feel when you're out there? How do you put yourself in these photos? Give your own character to this, you know, bringing your audience into your mind, so to speak, right? This is the shit I'm trying to tap into when it gets to street photography, because I am and always have been a people watcher, right? So this comes to my obsession with like, I want to capture these things the way I'm seeing them. I haven't quite mastered that yet. And I think it's because I've only been doing this stuff for, you know, since April. So I have a long ways to go until I can figure this out. But, you know, I'm happy to share these things with you all. Anyways, back to this. So let's set this lens to an F8. And then I'm gonna put the central focus point of the lens to three meters. And you'll notice that when we do that and we're at an F8, everything from one and a half meters to infinity will now be in focus because that's what it's telling me on the lens. So what this means is as long as your subject is at least four and a half feet or more away, 
everything's gonna be in focus. And that is really nice for street photography. It basically takes your modern camera vintage lens combo and turns it into a point and shoot. I kind of like that. So if you follow me on Instagram, you know, you've seen where I did a little project, a little mini series called Blur on Brand. Now, a little funny trick to that, I did all of that handheld, even at super slow shutters on a camera with no IBIS. The little trick to that is you just do the two second timer. I just set the timer and I just hold it Super steady, boom. And you can get pretty nice results when shooting at super slow shutter speeds, handheld, even with a camera that does not have IBIS. You know, all of these were shot with around one tenth or one fifteenth of a second, all handheld. So that's a little pro tip there. If you're interested in my stills settings that I use with the FP, I am gonna share the QR code so you can just, you know, take a picture of it with your own FP and load those still settings into your own camera. For anyone that's interested in that, of course, you would have to be a Sigma FP or FPL owner which honestly the FPL is the better camera for stills. One of the biggest downsides with this Canon Serenar lens is the heavy vignette when shooting wide open on full frame. However, if you are on a crop sensor or you can shoot in DC mode, AKA super 35 mode like the FP, well then you're obviously gonna take advantage of the best qualities of these lenses. And in some cases, I actually dig the vignette on this lens because it adds so much character to this already unique image that the lens renders in the first place. And if you do prefer to shoot in color, well, then you probably already noticed that this lens has a nice vintage saturated look all on its own because the contrast is quite heavy. And that's also something else that is really nice for monochrome photography. So there you go. Um, I hope you enjoyed all of those very amateur photos. Um, try not to judge them on the content, just kind of judge them on the rendering of the lens, right? So again, links below, and that is the easiest way to help this channel stay afloat. Speaking of which, if you are not already subscribed, be sure to tap that subscribe button. And if you are a current subscriber, thank you, but do me a favor, check down there and make sure that the bell is turned on because if it is on, you will get notified instantly every time I drop a new video. Now, if you are a super fan of what I do here, or maybe you just have more questions, maybe you wanna have more of a unique experience with myself and the stuff that I'm creating, then I highly recommend the Dog Times Patreon. That is full of bonus content and behind the scenes and breakdowns of all the jobs I do here in Los Angeles. And that's a great way to see what goes on with me and my process as a content creator and a working cinematographer here in the Super Bowl of the filmmaking community. As always, thanks for watching. And for now, yeah, it's gonna be a big fat wrap. You know what it is? It's the fucking uh, mat box. It's too tight, I think it's caught up. Here we go, here we go, hold it, let me just get. Does that look sharp out there? All right. No, oh, tell them to stop. Hey, go back, please, go back. Out of the way, please. Chris, sorry, we're getting some B-roll real quick. Thanks, Chris. Sorry, one second. Okay, we're solid here, right? Yeah. Let's just let this live for a minute.